I'm Roger Jelinek, your host on uh, the Book Worlds, and my guest today um, is Jonathan Moore. Uh, he's the author of five books that we'll be talking about, uh, and uh, I want to introduce him uh, first by getting a little of his background. Um, Jonathan, uh, you have the classic book jacket copy on all your novels, which is you've done a lot of interesting odd jobs before you became an attorney. Can you tell us about them? Uh, well, I, I guess the easiest way to explain that is it took me a while to find myself um, after I graduated from college, uh, which itself took a while. I went to five undergraduate colleges before I... Five? Fi yeah. Um, my, my parents were very patient. Um, but after college, um, I had a job teaching English in Taiwan. Uh, I did that for three and a half years. I also owned a, a bar and, and restaurant in Taiwan. It was a Mexican restaurant. Um, and then during college, I had a few interesting jobs. I was a whitewater raft guide, and I was a counselor at a, a camp for juvenile sex offenders in, in Texas. So it was basically like a wilderness reform camp. Um, <laughs> And then during law school, I, I worked uh, as an investigator for the Washington, D.C. Public Defender Service. Uh, so that, that was an interesting little stint in criminal law. And then uh, after three years of teaching kindergarten and restaurant work, I decided um, to go to law school. And uh, then I, I ended up in Hawaii. But you only went to one law school? I only, well, technically no. I went, I went to two. And, but. But uh, I, I did one semester at the University of Arizona in Tucson, and that was entirely due to Hurricane Katrina. Huh. And, uh, but because you were there during Katrina? Yeah, I, 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 had, I went to Tulane for law school in New oh. Orleans, and I had to evacuate the city for Hurricane Katrina, and it shut down the city for, for months, and so Tulane didn't reopen during that semester, and all the students ended up scattered all over the country. Oh, fascinating. But you actually, but you did work there for a while, did you? In New Orleans? Yeah. I, after I, you graduated? Uh, no. It, I worked there uh, during one of my summers in uh, between semesters at, at law school, and then I worked there during the semester uh, as a basically an intern in a law firm. Were you writing all along, all through this time? No, actually. So I, I I had wanted to write um, basically since I was about six years old, and so I, I, when I was a kid, I wrote a lot of short stories. And w when I got into college, I started writing novels. So I wrote my first novel when I was 20, and then I wrote uh, another one at 21 and 22. And then I, I graduated from college and um, moved to Taiwan and got hit with writer's block that lasted for about 10 years and it, it was very frustrating for me because I I had loved writing fiction but I just I couldn't bring myself to do it and I, I was so jealous of people who could that for 10 years I didn't even read fiction because I, I would just get angry every time I saw a novel so I read nonfiction and then uh, after I got settled in Honolulu I I started reading fiction again, and then one day I, I sat down with an idea and, and wrote my my first book that would become published. Now, the the of the five books that have been published, do, do they include the two that you wrote when you were in college? Or? Uh, no, the, those those books will never yeah. see the light of day. Okay, so in Honolulu here, you're a lawyer at a very prominent law firm, uh, Kobayashi, Sugita, and Goda. How long have you been there? Uh, I've, I've been there since 2008. Oh, that's a pretty high-powered firm, downtown it, firm. Yeah, we, we, we see a lot of the large cases, and, and I, it, it's a great job uh, for me as a writer, actually, because I get to see all manner of different people and businesses and, and just learn of the ins and outs of so many different industries. Big law firms are notorious for uh, working very hard. When do you sleep? Um, usually from... 10 a.m. to or 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. and I, I, it's it's better now. When I was a, a green associate, that those were hard times. Uh -huh. But but now I can push off all that work onto our, our junior guys. Well, you've written this uh, trilogy 
uh, about San Francisco. Um, uh, tell us what what you had in mind uh, with these three books. You know. it, so the the books begin with with my novel, The Poison Artist, and that came out in January of two thousand sixteen, um, and and I, so the, all all three of these books are, are murder mysteries, and, and they're all they're quite dark. Um, I think Stephen King said the Poison Artist was the most terrifying thing he had read since Red Dragon, or, or something to that effect. Uh, so they're they're very dark books. But Let me just just say when uh, just tell us the story of how you got Stephen King to say anything about it. <laughs> uh, I, I had been a fan of Stephen King since I was in the fourth grade, and my father gave me a copy of It, uh, which is timely since that that just came out as a movie, um, but. So, so I, I'd, I'd read every book that he's published, and when I had The Poison Artist coming out, my editor asked me to write fan letters to authors that I particularly liked. So I wrote a fan letter to Stephen King and gave it to my editor, and I, I, you know, months went past and I didn't hear anything, and I figured I never would. And then on, on my birthday in 2015, I was coming home from a fishing trip. I was out on the water all day and um, came back and checked my phone as soon as I got back to the dock. And there was an email from my editor forwarding an email from Stephen King. And it, it, it's lucky that I did not get that email while I was out on the water. I pro <laughs> probably would have fallen off the boat. I was, I was blown away. Stephen King said, I haven't read anything so terrifying since Red Dragon. That's the book by Thomas Harris that introduced Hannibal Lecter. That's quite a, quite a compliment. Uh, it's amazing. For, it's amazing to have got him to read it, and he obviously had read it. You know. Yeah, he, he obviously did. And I, I eventually emailed him to thank him. It, it took me a couple of months to get up the nerve to email him back. Um, but I, I did email him back, and he, he had a few comments about the book, so I know he, he really did read it. Uh, but at, at first, I kind of wondered if, if he had read the same book that I had written, because I, I've always thought of The Poison Artist as kind of a, a, a dark love story, but not necessarily terrifying. Oh, I found it pretty terrifying. <laughs> you know. uh, tell us a bit more about it, about the premise and... It, the the main character in the Poison Artist, Caleb Maddox, is a, a San Francisco toxicologist who is is studying the chemical effects of pain on the human body, and he has just suffered a uh, rather harsh breakup with his live-in girlfriend at the time that the novel starts, um, and he is is nursing his wounds, which are both psychological and physical. Uh, by drinking in a bar called um, the House of Shields, which is downtown right across from the palace. And he, he then asked me if I could write a third book that would sort of serve as a bridge between The Poison Artist and The Night Market. And I happened to already be writing a book uh, that had some connections to both, uh, so I just continued doing that. and and they changed the, the publication schedule around so that the, the Night Market would come out in 2018 and The Dark Room came out in 2017. Oh, what's fascinating to me is that you have a trilogy set in the same city, mostly at night, uh, with very much the same feel, but they're actually three different genres. Uh, the, the Night Market that's coming up, as you say, is sort of uh, set in the near future with some pretty scary high-tech uh, uh, in it. Uh, the Dark Room uh, that was published last, last year, mm -hmm. yes, is actually a, a, a much more conventional police procedural, um, very precise, uh, but much more in the classic uh, mode of, of uh, crime fiction. Uh, the Poison Artist, which is um, I think the scariest of three, I agree with Stephen King, it was really scary, uh, is, has a quite different kind of fantasy, psychology, terror in it, um, or with terrifying implications uh, of how you, people lose their minds, essentially. You know? So that, that's extraordinary. Um, the versatility involved in writing th three quite different kinds of books 
with some of the sim same characters, you know. Um, the the dark room, uh, James Patterson called it suspense that never stops. If you like Michael Connelly's novels, you will gobble up Jonathan Moore's The Dark Room. Do you want to tell us some more about that? Um, well, I, the the Michael Connelly comparison was uh, that that made me feel very warm and fuzzy inside. I, I love Michael Connelly's books. I, I've read them all. In fact, when I when I first discovered him, I kind of you know some some people like binge watch Netflix. I binge read Michael Connelly and read maybe fifteen or twenty Harry Bosch novels in a week, um, you know, which w it was a lot of fun. Um, we're, go we're going to take a break there, but we'll come back to this. Thanks. Guys, don't forget to check me out right here, The Prince of Investing. I'm your host, Prince Dykes. Each and every Tuesdays at 11 a.m. Hawaii time, I'm going to be right here. Stop by here from some of the best investment minds across the globe in real estate, finances, stocks, hedge funds, managers, all of that great stuff. Thank you. We're all part of your community. We all play a role in keeping our community safe. So protect your every day. If you see something suspicious, say something to local authorities. Jonathan, uh, you were saying about the dark room. Yeah. Oh well, uh, so I, I had gotten that blurb from from James Patterson mainly uh, through the efforts of my editor, um, and I, I think the the Connolly comparison, I'd like to think, is apt. Um, it it is a pol police procedural. I, I spent a lot of time researching the the procedural aspects. Um, during the process of researching the Poison Artist, I had made friends with some some cops in, in Sausalito and I contacted them frequently while writing the dark room. I have a, a private investigator friend here in Honolulu who also helped me with, with a few things. Mm. But uh, I, I thought that was a remarkable aspect of all three books was that obviously the amount of research you did for the books was phenomenal. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd love to know the background to some of it, you know. Uh, for instance, the, the geography of San Francisco, uh, I, I was quite tempted to follow you with Google Earth uh, or, or Google Maps because you were so precise, uh, um, almost obsessive. Tell us about that obsession. Well, it, I, I guess I have uh, kind of a funny relationship with San Francisco. When I went to, to undergraduate college there, or the, when I finally graduated from college, I was in San Francisco, so I spent three and a half or four years there and and while I was there I was I was so depressed the whole time that, that I it warped the way I saw things and I hated San Francisco I mean I just absolutely hated San Francisco I thought it was the worst place on planet earth and and really it, why it, it was cold it was always raining I was always getting dumped um, <laughs> the there I couldn't afford to do anything there. Um, I was I was too depressed to do the things that you can do in San Francisco for free, and and so I, I failed to see the beauty of it and saw only the ugliness. And, and there is a lot of ugliness in San Francisco. I mean, it's got an incredibly bad homeless problem. Uh, it's got huge drug problems. There's a lot of poverty, um, but but I, I didn't see any of the good parts. And then. When, when I moved here and, and started working at the law firm, I had to go to San Francisco quite a lot. And so then you know, I wasn't depressed anymore and I wasn't a poor student anymore. And so I could appreciate all the other aspects of San Francisco that I had missed the first time. But I still remembered seeing it in that kind of dark lens. And so I think all three of the books, San Francisco comes across as kind of this glittery dark place where where it's a, a beautiful city, but it's got a lot of shadows. A lot of shadows, yes. Wonderful, yeah. 
Um, one of the shadowier parts is the, the morgue. You spend a lot of time in the morgue in your books. Um, tell us about that. Well, I, when, I was, when I was writing The Poison Artist, and I, yeah, I actually started that book when I was in college and I couldn't finish it because I just didn't know anything about human relationships or, or police procedure or autopsies, or, and I didn't know how to start doing that research. And when I, when I uh, moved to Honolulu and started writing again, I decided to, to take another crack at this story. And uh, so I started doing the research, and I, I realized right away that I would need to know a lot about autopsies. So I contacted the Honolulu Medical Examiner's Office, and I asked them if they would let me come in and, and watch some autopsies and, and tour the facility. And they, they were, you know, very cautious with me at first because I was emailing them from my work account, so they knew I was an attorney. And I, I don't know, maybe they thought I was trying to set them up or something. but. Once they realized that that I was you know, wearing my mystery novelist hat, they they let me in with open arms. Um, and, you know, they asked if I could maybe put them on a show. Um, well, obviously I, I couldn't, but um, so I, I've, I my initial tour there, I had spent weeks setting it up, and when I finally got in, it was on the day my grandmother died, um, and so. I I'd spent all this time setting it up, so I went anyway, and and went in and, and found myself standing in a walk-in freezer full of dead bodies, and and you know had a very somber feeling at the time because I, I knew that my grandmother in Arkansas was in, in a similar setting, and and so it really it set a tone right away for me, and I the. I think the medical examiner scenes in all three of there's a lot of autopsies in all three of these books, and I, I think that they're fairly accurate um, as compared to what you would see. Were you upset by what you saw? I, it, it was it was sad and it, it was it was dirty and it, you know there's roaches on the floor and there's there's concrete floors that are wet and there's drains on the floor and it's cold. And it, it's cold, and it's nothing at all. It smells bad, and it's nothing at all like what you see on on a you know a cop show where everybody's well dressed and everything's sparkly and clean. Um, you know, when for example, the first thing they do in an autopsy is this Y incision that opens up your whole chest cavity, and they don't use specialized high tech medical equipment for it. They use pruning shears that they buy at Home Depot. Sure. Um, <laughs> Oh wow! And but then you got into into the uh, the actual the technical aspects of it in in considerable detail. It's not something you see on the Y five O, for instance. No. no. Um, so but, yeah, I, I spent a lot of time researching that. I have um, several friends who are doctors, so they they helped me out a lot there. And then uh, you know I, I'm not too shy about just cold calling people and asking questions when I have questions. Uh, I, I, what I found particularly uh, wonderful was the, the very exact logic, um, the scientific logic that you have researched and present. Um, so it's sort of classically in the, in the line of Sherlock Holmes. I guess I guess he was the founder of it, um, but it's beautifully done and it's it's it's, uh, it's a huge amount of information. I found there was a surprising a, a new surprising piece of information almost on every page. You know, it's, um, extraordinary. Um, you spent a lot of time in bars uh, uh, in the books. Um, you, knew, you know a lot about drinking, or the <laughs> drinks, or bartending. Tell us some more about that. How well, did, you, that, did that come about? I, I did own a bar once, um, so I, I, I learned some there. But, but uh, you know, part of, part of that is that that uh, San Francisco has has a great selection of, of old bars and speakeasies and, and really gorgeous and dark and strange places to drink and and I, I think I think that that alcohol and 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 uh, you know massive consumption of alcohol and and the criminal underworld kind of go hand in hand so. So I think those two things tend to, to come together. Um, 
but in terms of how I, how I know about the, the drinks that are served in the Poison Artists, um, I've certainly Well, there's one all. particular drink. You want to describe that? That's <laughs> well, there, a major yeah, there, element in the there, book. There's a, there's a lot of absinthe <laughs> in the Poison Artist, and, mm -hmm. and so I, I, I did have to go and, and research that. That wasn't something I had any personal experience with before I started writing that book. Um, but I knew it was the drink for a particular character, and so I had to go seek it out. And it's a it's a good drink. You want to describe it? it well, I don't think many people will be familiar with it. Yeah, um, you know, I, 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 is I, it still illegal? No, no, it was it was legalized in the U.S. in 2007. So you can you can buy it in, in any good liquor store, and you can order it online. Why was it illegal? The, it, it was there was a push to illegalize it in in France in I think the 1920s maybe or 1890s um, mainly because there was this perception that the wormwood in it was poisonous and was causing people to go insane. Um, in in fact, to to be poisoned by the wormwood in absinthe, you would have to drink so much that the alcohol would kill you far be long before the the wormwood would have any effect. And so the the problems that people were seeing back then were just due to like hardcore alcoholics making fools of themselves, and I think maybe the the push to illegalize absinthe was driven by uh, wine producers in France who were worried that that absinthe was going to cut into their business. And uh, but there's quite there's a ritual involved in drinking. It, it's it's yeah. a highly ritualized drink. Yeah. Uh, mo most good drinks have their rituals, and, and absinthe has a, an elaborate one that has a lot of equipment. Can you describe it? it? Well, you, you, you take a glass and and you set a slotted spoon over the top of the glass, and then you put a sugar cube on top of the slotted spoon, and then you get this crystal reservoir of water that has a little faucet on it, and you set the faucet on a slow drip. So it drip, drip, drips and melts the sugar cube into the absinthe. And the cold water uh, causes a, you know, the, the various uh, herbal oils that are dissolved in the, the alcohol to, to come out of solution. And it makes the absinthe change color from clear green to this sort of milky opalescent And it color. changes the taste as against it, it, just pouring water into it? Yeah, it, yeah. it does change the taste. You become an expert. Uh, I suppose. <laughs> but no, no. Well, you, you, you've actually bought a bunch of it and drink it, right? Yeah, well, I, I bought five bottles and I gave three away, but I did drink the other two. Uh, well, you can drink it very slowly. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're a lawyer. You've been a lawyer for quite a long time, but you don't write legal thrillers. No, I, I mean, I, my, my goal is to write books that people would want to read and, and to write books that keep turning the pages. And, and from what I've seen of the law, of what I, I like it, but I, I haven't figured out how to make a, a, a legal story into a thrilling story. And I know that some people are, are fully capable of doing it. I mean, To, to Kill a Mockingbird is a legal yeah. story, and it's a great one. Um, but for whatever reason, that's just not my, my forte. Oh, well, um, you've got, you set yourself quite a reading list in January of this year, <laughs> and you, you say somewhere, uh, what's, what, what's, what are you reading now? Uh, right, right now I'm reading Blake Crouch, um, he, I'm, I'm reading his novel Dark Matter, and I'm about halfway through it, and it's, it's compelling and strange. Okay. Well, that about wraps it up. Uh, the Night Market is, is being published in January, uh, and uh, Jonathan, I hope, will show up at the Hawaii Book and Music Festival in May. And uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you, Roger. Yeah.